So here's week three. Here's the embryo. So what we're doing here is we are looking down on the upper surface of the epiblast. Okay, so here's that epiblast. The hypoblast would be behind the screen on this image. One of the things we can see is that this embryo is no longer circular as it was originally, but it has started to elongate. And notice that the axis along which it elongates, this axis, is the axis that goes from head to tail. Right? We know where the head is, that's where the precordal plate is, that's the tail. So it elongates along the head-tail axis. So now that we have an, a, a polarity, we're already using that polarity, it will elongate along that axis. And furthermore, we see that the head end of the embryo is going to get wider than the tail end of the embryo because the head end is where the brain is going to develop, so we need that end to be bigger, so the head end gets wider. So that's the, f the shape of the uh, embryo at this point, but now we're going to see how we convert this into a three-layered embryo. What's going to happen is in the midline of the epiblast, in the caudal half of the epiblast, this half, the caudal half of the epiblast, in the midline, there's going to develop a groove. And that groove is going to be called the primitive groove or the primitive streak. Now, what's happening here is the following. The cells of the epiblast from the left side and the cells of the epiblast from the right side are migrating toward the midline. So these cells from the right side are migrating toward the midline. These cells from the left side are migrating toward the midline. And here, we see them all migrating toward the midline. When those cells reach the midline, they're going to turn and go into that groove. In other words, on this diagram, head into the screen to get to the other side of the screen. In other words, they're going to move in the direction of the hypoblast. So cells are going from the right side of the epiblast down through the primitive streak toward the hypoblast. So in order for us to see how that's going to happen, what we'll do is we'll make a section across the embryo where the started line is, turn it up on edge, and we'll see this image. So what we're saying is the cells from the left side and the cells from the right side of the epiblast migrate to the midline, get to that primitive streak, and then go through the primitive streak and head in the direction of the hypoblast. So let's see what happens to those cells. Some of those cells will migrate through the primitive streak, go all the way to where the hypoblasts the cells are. They will invade the hypoblast, and more and more of those epiblast cells will invade the hypoblast. As they invade the hypoblast, they will push the hypoblast cells out of the way. Those hypoblast cells will get displaced and eventually will die. And eventually, all of these hypoblast cells will get replaced by these epiblast cells that are now living in that layer. They're living where the hypoblast cells used to live. And those epiblast cells that are now living there, we're going to call endoderm. So endoderm cells are epiblast cells that migrated through the primitive streak and are now living where the hypoblast cells used to live. So this layer of cells will become the endoderm. There will be other cells of the epiblast that also migrate through the primitive streak. They start heading in the direction of the hypoblast. They just don't go as far, and they end up filling in this space. Remember, we said the epiblast and hypoblast are not fused together everywhere other than where the uh, procordial plate is. So there is a space that they can occupy in between those two layers. And these cells will start to occupy that space in between the layers. And more and more of them will do that. They'll fill in that space between the two layers. And those cells will start to become a middle layer of cells. And the prefix for middle is meso. And so we will call those the mesoderm cells. Those are the mesoderm cells. So... Notice that the cells that are becoming the mesoderm cells, when they enter that middle layer, they migrate to either the right side of the embryo or the left side of the embryo. They did not stay right in the midline. They enter the middle layer and then migrate to the right or to the left to form that mesoderm. 
there are going to be other cells from the epiblast that migrate through the primitive streak, enter that middle layer, and they do stay in the midline. They do stay in the midline. These cells stay in the midline. Those cells <clears throat> will be called the notochord cells. Those are the notochord. So we end up with a middle, la middle layer that's made up of notochord in the midline and mesoderm on the right and left sides. So notochord and mesoderm come from epiblast, <clears throat> just like endoderm comes from epiblast. Finally, we have other epiblast cells that stay in this upper layer. They do not migrate through the primitive streak. They stay in the upper layer, and we just change their name, and we call them ectoderm cells. So the cells of the epiblast that do not migrate through the primitive streak remain as the ectoderm cells. That'll be the ectoderm layer. We will then subdivide those ectoderm cells into three kinds of ectoderm, depending upon where in the upper layer they are found. Those that are closest to the midline, these cells, we're going to call neuroectoderm. The ones immediately alongside them, we're going to call neurocrest ectoderm. Then all of the remainder, we're going to call surface ectoderm. So we're going to end up with three kinds of ectoderm, depending upon where in that upper layer they, be, they are found. So we now have all of the germ layers of an embryo. We have ectoderm, mesoderm, notochord, and endoderm. And as we said, all of them came from the epiblast. Right? All of them came from the epiblast because all of the hypoblast cells die off. So we have the th all of the germ cells, all germ layer cells that we need to go on to form the embryo. Now, if we look at this chart, we see the chart divided into three columns representing the three layers. The upper layer is ectoderm, and we see surface ectoderm, and then if we go to the next slide, neuroectoderm and neurocrest ectoderm, so the three kinds of ectoderm. In the middle layer, we see mesoderm, and we see notochord. And in the lower layer, we see endoderm. And in the chart, we have a listing of all the adult structures, not all, many of the adult structures that are derived from those different cell types. Now, <clears throat> what we don't want to do at this point is just try to memorize this chart and memorize what comes from which layer. That's, that's not a particularly useful thing to do. We will get to virtually everything that's on this chart and talk about where it comes from when we get to those particular organs as we work our way through the body. But for right now, there are really just a couple of points that I want to make about this slide. Firstly, notice that the notochord gives rise to only one adult structure. That's the only thing it gives rise to, the nucleus pulposus, which is the inner part of an intervertebral disc. <clears throat> so that makes it seem like the notochord is not particularly important. Well, in fact, in the adult, the notochord is not particularly important. But in the early embryo, it was very important. Let's go back and look at our embryo for a second and see where the notochord is. <clears throat> There's the notochord right in the middle of everything. It's right in the middle of anything, everything. And what the job of the notochord is during this very early stage in the third week of development is the notochord is sending out chemical signals to all the cells surrounding it. These cells and these cells and these cells and these cells, giving those cells signals to tell those cells what direction of, of differentiation sh they should take. So these cells know what they should become, and these cells know what they should become, and these cells know what they should become based upon signals that are coming to them from the notochord. Once all of those cells have been set on their respective paths of differentiation, then you don't need the notochord anymore. Okay? So the notochord is very important early in development, but once development has proceeded, then you don't need the notochord anymore. So the notochord is sometimes referred to as the primary organizer. It's what sort of sets everything else up on its respective paths for differentiation. Okay? But once that's finished, we don't have any use for it anymore, and what remains of it, basically as a vestige, 
is what becomes the uh, nucleus pulposus of the intervertebral disc. The other point that I want to make on this slide brings your attention to this word, epithelial lining. So here on, on the endoderm, you see a listing of a bunch of structures and things like GI tract and respiratory system and so forth. <clears throat> but notice it says the epithelial lining of those organs. The point is that endoderm only gives rise to epithelial cells. So it's not really correct to say that the endoderm gives us the GI tract or the endoderm gives us the respiratory system. It would be correct to say that the endoderm gives us the epithelial lining of the GI tract or the epithelial lining of the respiratory system. But the other components of the GI tract, the smooth muscle, the connective tissue, and so forth, that doesn't come from endoderm. That's going to come from mesoderm. Because endoderm only gives us epithelial cells. Similarly, ectoderm gives us epithelial cells. So if you look here on the surface epidermis, you see it says epidermis. It doesn't say skin. It says epidermis. Just the epithelial layer of the skin comes from ectoderm. The underlying dermis, which is connective tissue, doesn't come from ectoderm. It comes from mesoderm. Okay? So we're going to see that the cell types derived from ectoderm and the cell types that de derive from endoderm are all going to be epithelial or epithelial-derived cells. So all those other cell types that we're going to find in the body, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, skeletal muscle, bone, cartilage, visceral organs, and so forth, they must all be coming from mesoderm. And that, in fact, is going to be the case. Okay? All right. One last point. We've now, at the end of three weeks, have developed all of the cell types that we need to develop our embryo. The only problem we still have is that we have a three-layered flat embryo. And in order to get to the adult body form, we need that embryo not to be flat, but to be round. Because the adult body form is round, as we'll see in a moment. So, Let's take a look at what's going to happen in the fourth week. So look, just looking at this part of this, here we have our three-layered embryo. Here's our ectoderm, here's our mesoderm, here's our endoderm. Three layers, flat. What will then happen in the fourth week is that this embryo will start to fold. It'll basically fold around. This lateral side and that lateral side will fold around like this. You can see it folding down, folding down. And eventually, as that edge and that edge come toward the midline, they will fuse. In other words, that edge and that edge will fuse. And once that happens, we will have converted these three flat layers into three tubes. A tube inside a tube inside a tube. What had been the bottom layer is now the innermost layer or the innermost tube. So it's a tube of endoderm. We just said that the endoderm will become the epithelial lining of the gut tube. So we now have a gut tube lined by endoderm. That gut tube will run all the way through the embryo. It'll be open at the head end, the mouth, and it'll be open at the tail end, at the anus, running all the way through the embryo. What had been the upper layer of ectoderm okay, will end up becoming the outer layer of ectoderm surrounding everything. So the epidermis of our skin is completely surrounding the embryo. And of course, what had been the middle layer is still going to be the middle layer. It'll be between the endoderm on the inside and the ectoderm on the outside. So if you think about the adult body form, we basically have a tube inside a tube inside a tube, the innermost tube being the lining of the gut tube, the outermost tube being the surface of the skin, and everything in between being derived from the mesoderm. And what we have in between the inner surface and the outer surface, of course, is bone and cartilage and muscle and connective tissue. And we said all of that should be coming from mesoderm, and so it does. So we now have the adult body form. And that's now established in the fourth week with the body fold. But recognize, in order for this to happen normally, that edge and that edge, 
the edges of the lateral body folds have to fuse with one another. That has to fuse with that to give us our ventral body wall, to close off the ventral body wall. And as it turns out, and we're going to see this theme over and over again in development, when things are supposed to fuse during development, sometimes they don't fuse perfectly. You'll have imperfections of fusion. And when you have imperfections of fusion, that will lead to some kind of a defect. So in this case, if the right and left lateral body folds have an imperfect fusion, have a defect in the fusion, you can see how you could have a region of the ventral body wall that is weakened or has a defect in it. And that we might call, we might call that gastroschisis or gastroschisis. Gastro means belly, schism means split, split belly. In other words, there's a split or a defect in the belly wall, defect in the ventral body wall because of a defect in the fusion of the right and left body folds. And if you have a defect in the ventral body wall, that means that things that should be inside the belly can escape and get outside the belly. And so you can see something like this. Where loops of intestine that should be inside the abdomen have escaped and gotten outside the abdomen. And that would be gastroscosis. Now, when you look at this, you know, your first inclination might be to say, well, that's a GI tract defect, right? You have GI tract in the wrong place. But it's not a GI tract defect. It's actually a body wall defect. There's the defect in the body wall. It's a body wall defect through which GI tract escaped through which GI tract escaped, okay? There's going to be a, another defect in which there'll be loops of bowel outside the body. We'll talk about that when we get to the development of the GI tract. That's going to be called a phallocele. It's an entirely different defect with an entirely different cause. Um, the only thing they have in common is that they both have loops of bowel outside the abdomen. But gastroscosis is really a body wall defect, not a GI tract defect. And when you have gastroscosis, the loops of bowel are outside of the belly and outside the umbilical cord. Here's the umbilical cord right here. Okay, and this is outside the umbilical cord. As we will see when we get to the GI tract, when you have a phallocele, the loops of bowel will be outside the belly, but they'll be inside the umbilical cord. And that'll be a way for us to distinguish what, which defect it is, gastroscosis or phallocele. But more about that when we get to the GI tract. Okay, so we've completed the first four weeks of development. What we said we wanted to accomplish was to go through the timeline of what happens in each week. Remember, in the first week, we go from fertilization through implantation. The second week, we have the two-layered two, -week em two -layered embryo. Third week, gastrulation to give us the three-layered embryo. And in the fourth week, body folding. We talked about how the gonads form and give us uh, gametes through spermatogenesis and oogenesis. And we've talked about the uh, formation of the three basic germ layers, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm, plus, of course, notochord, and uh, what uh, adult cell types are derived from each of those.